as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Those would be the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. To those disciples there as he considered the nature of God, his heavenly Father's grace. In light of everything that had happened, perhaps the simplest thing that the Lord could have done was just destroyed Adam and Eve. They had, after all, by their own action, corrupted nature and themselves, introducing sin into a world that God had intended to create blameless, perfect, and without sin or iniquity. He had told them on the day that they partook of that fruit, on the day that they bit into it, they would surely die. Yet it wouldn't be a physical death. It wouldn't be a corporal or a temporal death as we understand it amidst our knowledge and amidst our wisdom. It would be a spiritual death that led to the decay of the flesh as they eventually succumbed to the grave. With the introduction of sin into the world, and that corruption introduced to the spirit and the soul. God knew that they would never be able to live according to his standard, that they would always and forever fall short of the measure that he had lain out. Perfection was forsaken. It had been forsaken for the wisdom of this world and the knowledge that they believed that it held as they gave in to the temptations of the devil. Since it was then abandoned, nothing that Adam and Eve, nothing that their seed could have ever done, would realize the faultlessness and the perfection, the blamelessness that the Lord their God, their divine and holy creator, demanded. This very well could have been the end of the story right there. Yet merciful in his love, compassionate in his grace. The Lord would not let it be. They stood before the judgment of the Lord their God, before the judgment of the Creator who had formed them by his own hand, and they were ashamed. Ashamed not that they broke his command or that they disobeyed his word, but because and that new knowledge that they had obtained by partaking of that forbidden fruit, they had come to realize that they were naked. They had already in that shame tried to hide from God, yet they could not do it. As he came looking for them, there was no place that they could hide that was out of his sight. Now as they stood before him, sorrow filled him because he knew what their defiance meant. He could not let those who had now, by their own hand, become corrupted in their very nature, dwell amongst the fulfillment of perfection in its uncorrupted form. Yet as he sent them from paradise, as he expelled them from Eden for their unrighteousness, his judgment would be tempered by his compassion and his love. It would be tempered by his mercy, that mercy that he had for his new creation. Looking upon their faces, knowing what they had done, still he could not abandon them or forsake them, even as they forsook his words and his decrees. He had formed them with his hands. He had breathed air into their lungs. He had given them life. He was their father. And even as they now had to depart from him, he could not ignore or forget that fact. From his words then would come the voice of mercy as a promise was given and a prophecy of an abiding hope that they could put their reliance in was handed to them. As he pronounced his sentence for their sin and their iniquity, as he pronounced his sentence for their disobedience and their rebellion, he 
would make a sacred vow, a blessed covenant with them. There would come a day when the imperfection of this world would no longer have a hold over them, when sin would no longer clutch them in its grasp. There would come a time when the dark power of sin, death, and the devil would be put to flight and they would be ransomed from it. On that day, a divine reconciliation would occur as a spiritual divide between God and man would finally be bridged and there would be a path back to paradise and the perfection of God's original design for humanity. The road to redemption and reconciliation would come from the womb of the woman, from the seed of the woman. As he would tell the serpent, so he would promise unto all of mankind for all ages, for all generations. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. A savior, a messiah. A righteous and a glorious Redeemer would rise amidst a sinful world, and there he would crush the head of the devil under his heel, no longer allowing it to have any power or authority over God's beloved creation. His life would be the perfect sacrifice that mankind, in its own unrighteousness, could not give would be the perfect life that they could not live. Then, as the words were spoken, he sent them, his children, out into the vast world beyond Eden. Here the first sin offering would be given as God would fashion clothing from the hides of animal to cover Adam and Eve. They would be gone from the garden. Yet he knew that there would come a day when the perfect sin offering would be given through the sacrifice of his son, the anointed one, for the righteousness and the reconciliation of mankind unto him. For Adam and Eve, the world would be harsh and hard, full of toils and turmoil pain and challenges, as they would labor by their hands for all that they had. No longer would they dwell amidst the wondrous glories of Eden, where everything was at their fingertips. Yet there would still come the hope that one day, through the fulfillment of the promises made by the Lord God their Creator, they would return to it the imperfections washed from their spirit as their souls became as white as snow. Then they would once more take on the perfect form that God had created them in. They would always and forever be looking towards that faithful assurance, that faithful promise knowing that their Creator was still ever-present in their lives. For thousands of years would mankind wait on that promise. Yet prophets and kings, faithful servants and righteous saints, they would never lose their hope in it or the expectations they had on it. In devoted anticipation, they would commit their lives to watching and waiting to preparing for that day when the Messiah would come in glory as a king of kings and as a suffering servant, as a great high priest, and as an anointed sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. They knew. They knew that when he did, he would crush the head of evil. He would crush the head of the serpent, and he would end the devil's dark hold on this world. It was then, and only then, that we would be reconciled unto our Lord. 
in Christ Jesus, that long-awaited Savior would finally come. Ransoming a fallen race, he would set captivity captive as he broke the chains of bondage that mankind was held in. He would put to flight sin, death, and the devil. There, through their iniquity, all may die, but through Christ Jesus, all shall rise again, the grave no longer having any power over them. What a blessed promise. What a blessed promise of righteousness we have from our God. Until the next time, I'm Wyatt McIntyre. Thanks for tuning in. And may the Lord bless you and keep you in the blessed faith of our Redeemer, even unto life everlasting. Amen.